Hello and welcome. Hi, my name is Tommy Crampton, Education Manager at AHEAD. Welcome to the AHEAD Members Winter Series um, Webinar 3, Offering Choice and Assessment. And a big thank you to the members of AHEAD who support our mission and engage with us in all sorts of really meaningful ways to improve access and inclusion for people with disabilities in their institutions. Today, I'm here with my AHEAD colleagues, Jess Dunn, the Comms and Events Officer, and Trevor Boland, e-learning and digital media officer. And also joining us today is Dr. Lisa Padden from UCD, Access and Life Learning, who will explore offering choice and variety in an assessment of how and why. Lisa's been a real leader and strong advocate of UDL in the education field for many years. Trevor has been at the forefront of driving the AHEAD Sister Technology products and in training in UDL, for example, Digital Badge, which is currently running, and also um, check out our Discovery AT tool and AT Hive on our AHEAD website. Before we start, I'd like to just go through a few housekeeping reminders. If you require closed captions, they're available by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And a big thanks also to a captioner, Karen, who's providing professional captions here today with us. If you want to engage with each other today, by all means, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, most suitable way to put comments in. And also remember, if you're adding messages or comments, remember just to change the field in the drop down menu from panelists to everybody. Um, otherwise, uh, we will only see the messages. Any messages that are missed out, I will, I will disseminate um, later in the, the webinar. If you have any questions to ask the panelists directly during the session, please pop them into the Q&A box and we'll get them at the end of the contribution. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on questions to avoid putting them in the main chat as we may miss them, as I mentioned earlier. Lastly, if you're a Twitter user and you're tweeting your thoughts, please do be sure to use the hashtag at ahead Ireland. So we can see your tweet and we can engage with that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over and I'm introduce Dr. Lisa Padden, who's going to introduce the finding the balance between offering choice and assessment and ensuring quality rigor and equality between choices. Um, thanks, Lisa. I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Tommy. So I'm just going to share my screen. Jess, you might give me permission to share. Perfect. Uh, welcome, everyone. I see a lot of familiar uh, names on the participant list. Um, I'm sure you've heard me before at the UDL webinars and elsewhere. And Trevor and I are, um, as always, doing a two-hander. Uh, the dream team, Trevor. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lee. The Thelma so, Louise. Thelma Louise, I love that. Yeah, we can decide who's who later. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about choice and diversity of assessment, um, as you've heard. So just to say a little bit about my role in UCD, I work in access and lifelong learning, as Tom said. Um, and I lead our University for All initiative. So University for All is our whole institution approach to access and inclusion. Um, so looking at teaching, learning and assessment as the first pillar, then student supports and services, then the uh, physical environment and the technological infrastructure. So all of that together um, to create an inclusive university for all students. So really moving the idea of access from beyond actually admissions to a university to how we actually need to adapt the institution to uh, include all students rather than what has been done maybe traditionally before, which is looking at how we can adapt students to fit into the institution. So today I'm going to talk about um, inclusion in the pandemic uh, pivot, uh, which we're still in, that's an ever changing situation. Um, so look at inclusive assessment within that and um, inclusive assessment and how it fits in with universal design for learning. I'll talk to you a bit about some research that I did um, last year with Dr. Jordan O'Neill um, on choice and diversity of assessment, where we explored the barriers and enablers um, for choice and diversity. And then we'll talk specifically about implementing choice and how to do that in a kind of structured um, and hopefully successful way. So pre-pandemic, um, from my experience, what we had was a really, really significant increase in the number of students reporting exam anxiety specifically. So not necessarily uh, availing of disability support, but availing specifically of an alternative exam location because of exam anxiety. We also 
year on year see this increase in the number of students with disabilities availing of alternative exam locations and extra time. So an increase in the need for reasonable accommodations for students with disabilities. And we did see some progress in embedding choice and diversity of assessment, but that was really relatively slow. Um, and I think you can see that across the sector, not just in Ireland, but beyond um, in terms of the research that's been done, the examples that have come out, it's been very, very slow progress to get change implemented in the area of assessment specifically. I think there's been a lot more progress on um, inclusion in the classroom, other types of teaching and learning activities, but assessment has been the slowest to change. So apologies if you went to UCD or Trinity College Dublin, because you see on the screen now I have an image of the uh, RDS, our big event hall set up for the exams. Um, and for UCD, that means two and a half thousand students um, all together in the exam hall. Uh, it used to be four times a day, six days a week um, to sit their timed exams. So in UCD, we have 30,000 students. So it's a real numbers game in terms of the time to face to face exams and how we get everybody into the same place. And it's a military operation, um, but a very stressful one for students. So this environment caused an enormous amount of stress for lots and lots of students. And for every student that came to us to talk to us about the stress and exam anxiety they experienced, there were lots more that didn't. Um, and in terms of the pandemic pivot, for me, the big win from COVID, kind of win from COVID, was we didn't go to the RDS last year. So there was no mass timed face-to-face -face exams. Um, so the positive changes that came out were the large exam halls not being used, but also students' needs actually became more visible and immediate um, when we went online. So things like technology needs, assistive technology needs, um, we saw far more queries from staff than we ever had before in terms of how do I accommodate this student? How can I put these supports in place? Um, and there were positives in terms of those support needs being very much more visible. And we did, because of necessity, see a move to other assessment types. Now, the level of creativity in terms of the changes varied, understandably, um, but we did see more diversity in the assessment methods and the elimination of exams actually in a lot of disciplines. So now that we've, uh, we're beginning to come back to some uh, new normal, I hate all these COVID -y terms, um, we, have, we are going to see, or the plan is to go back to this um, exam hall in a few weeks time. Um, whether or not that will happen remains to be seen. Uh, but to me, that's a real negative. I think we saw so much positive change um, in the last year that we really need to look for ways to hold on to those positive changes and sustain those positive changes um, in any way that we can. And one of the areas that we really need to focus on is assessment and feedback for students. So universal design for learning, I'm pretty sure everybody on this call is pretty familiar with it now, but there's three, three key principles. So multiple means of engagement, representation, action and expression. And it's in action and expression that we see a lot of our choice of assessment and diversity assess of assessment. Um, and inclusive assessment does link in with universal design for learning, absolutely, and universal design for instruction. Um, and we did a piece of work where we mapped on the different um, our kind of concepts for inclusive assessment onto the principles of universal design for learning and linked them as well with universal design for instruction. And I'll go through these um, principles now. So when you're talking about inclusive assessment, transparency is the number one thing that you need to look for. So this is the easiest thing you can do without making any change to the mode of your assessment or the method of your assessment, you can make your assessment completely transparent. That means telling students at the beginning of the semester how they're going to be assessed, why they're being assessed that way. So trusting the student as a partner in their learning um, and making sure that they have everything that they need around that assessment. So there's no surprises. There should be no surprises when it comes to the assessment in your modules. Scaffolded assessment, meaning that if you require somebody to have a skill to engage in, a, in an assessment activity, that you give them the resources, you teach them that skill. So whether that's essay writing, presentations, exams, MCQs, whatever method you've chosen to use, that you've actually trained students in how to be successful in that method. 
and we haven't made assumptions and that's the mistake that's made uh, very often to make an assumption that a student has a particular skill and there's all sorts of reasons why a student might may not have engaged in that activity before or may come with their own preconceived notions I mean even with essay writing as an example a student who comes into a master's course okay we well maybe we'll assume that they've written an essay before so we don't need to teach them that but I've met lots of students who in their undergraduate program either didn't write essays at all or they wrote very specific types of essays and now they're being asked for something completely different so we really can't make assumptions and it's I suppose it's a link back to what we're doing in the classroom and the day-to-day -day teaching and move away from the notion that content is king when it comes to your module. So when I have these conversations with academics, they say, well, I can't fit in a class on essay writing because I have to cover these 12 different topics. You go, okay, well, do you have to cover them in this way? Is there another way that you can teach essay writing? Because the skills development really works best when it's integrated into the teaching activities rather than an extra. So we can provide writing centers and we can do other types of academic skills development, but really if we want students to engage with it, it needs to be core to what they're doing in their, in their activities. Choice of assessment we'll talk about in a little bit and how we define choice of assessment. Variety of assessment means looking at how you're assessing in your module and making sure that there are different types of assessment. So you're not just using an essay for midterm and an essay for end of semester, or an essay for midterm and then essay-based questions in your exam for the end of semester. So really looking at having variety and appreciating the diversity that you have in the classroom, and therefore you need to have diversity in your assessment methods. So even if it's not choice, there should be some variety. And variety doesn't necessarily mean that you increase the workload for students. And sometimes that's what happens. The, we introduce all of these new methods of assessment and what it means is that the load on students really, really increases. Um, authentic assessment, so assessment that's really closely linked to the discipline that you're teaching, that it has real world um, application. Um, and that's really, I suppose, when you're talking to students and getting students buy-in, keeping them engaged and motivated, authentic assessment works really, really well. Having options for students to self-monitor and to self-assess so that a student knows how they're getting on as they go along through the module. So again, we're not getting all the way to week nine or 10 before we get any feedback. So students are kind of just completely in the dark about whether or not they're doing well, what areas they need to work on. So having that self-assessment, and that's something that doesn't have to take up an enormous amount of time. It doesn't have to be even something that's for credit um, in your module. Maybe it's something that's additional. Peer assessment and peer review, I'm, I've seen a lot of examples where that works really well, particularly when it's linked in with reflection. So being able to um, give somebody else feedback is such a good skill to give to students. And in certain disciplines, it's really core to that discipline. So in something like architecture or another design discipline that somebody can actually give feedback to another designer, which helps them to learn themselves as well. Um, having a programmatic approach, and I'll man mention this again in a little bit, but working with your colleagues across a program to come up with an assessment strategy. So if we talk about the different assessment methods that students might face, obviously having a program approach to that. So we know, okay, in this module, you're gonna cover essay writing. In that module, you're gonna cover presentations. And so you have a view across a program of how students are being assessed, where they're gaining the skills that they need and how that's linked to your program outcomes, your graduate attributes, et cetera. Now, two of the things, obviously, that are really important when it comes to all of this work is supportive policies within your institution or your organization, and then opportunities for staff development. So changing your assessment strategy does take time, and you do need to be supported to do it. So you as an individual can obviously change your assessment, but the impact of that is going to be minimized unless you have that programmatic approach. So unless there's a kind of staff development initiative where you can sit down with your colleagues and work on these issues and also share the workload when it comes to, so whether it's rubric development or um, other types of assessment development that you can share that work and work with each other on it. So as I said, the research that we did last year um, looked at the barriers and enablers to diversifying assessment. So we looked at diversity of assessment or variety of assessment and choice of assessment and um, where uh, the respondents in the research had implemented choice or diversity we asked what the benefits were was it successful and what we were really looking at was is there an association between the familiarity of the assessment method 
the required resources, whether that's time or money um, or some other type of resource um, and the success of the choice of assessment or diversity of assessment. So we had 160 module coordinators in UCD responded um, and they were relatively experienced. So just over half of them have more than 15 years experience and a third of them between six and 15 years. So 19, only 19% 19 had introduced choice of assessment. And we did have every discipline in the university um, covered in the respondents. So the first thing we did um, when we were designing the research methodology was uh, realize that we need to have a, a definition of choice and a definition of diversity because people define them in different ways. But when we talked about choice, and this is how we defined it in the research, we said it was where a student in the module, every student in the module has a choice between two or more different assessment methods. So a poster or a presentation, and they choose one of the assessment methods. So sometimes choice of assessment gets mixed up, mixed up with alternative assessment, where an alternative assessment is provided to maybe a student with a disability. But unless that choice is there, for everybody, we're not considering it choice of assessment. And then diversity of assessment is where you introduce an assessment method that's less familiar either to you or to, or to the students. So it doesn't necessarily have to be something completely brand new and super creative. It might just be something that's not normally used in your discipline. So that increases the range of assessments in your discipline. So replacing the end of semester exam with an essay or an online or a take home exam, something like that, if that's something that's not familiar to you or your discipline. So I'm gonna ask you first, our participants, um, in case you thought you were getting off the hook, to um, do a really tiny exercise. So I want you to tell me why you haven't implemented choice or diversity of assessment or why you haven't implemented more choice or diversity of assessment if you've done it already. So just free writing for two minutes and don't send it into the chat until the time is up. So this is something I've seen at a couple of um, events recently and I think it works really well. So I'm very interested to hear what you perceive as the barriers and whether it matches up to what we found in our research last year. So off you go, you've got two minutes. Well, Lisa, it's a great question. I love that point about the program planning and getting all the lectures from the modules to kind of coordinate, you know, their efforts. Yeah, I mean, that's the ideal. I, the, in UCD, that's challenging because everything is modularized. So um, I think probably 15 years ago now, every module became its own entity. Um, and that brought with it a lot of benefits for students because you could pick modules from all over the place but also a lot of challenges, particularly where assessment um, takes place. And one of the issues is around assessment load and the dates that things are due. Yeah. So we find that students have everything due all on the same day in the middle of week six, and then everything due all on the same day in the middle of week 12. Um, and then they also have the, all of their exams. <laughs> It's a real challenge to get people to come out of that siloed mindset to work. Definitely, and, and work collaboratively. Lisa, I think we just have a question there from yeah, Annie great. Connell. Annie, I can see your, your hand is raised. So uh, I'm going to allow you to talk now if you'd like to ask your question. So I've just uh, I've unmuted you there, Annie, if you if you have a question. Is that working for you, Annie? Jess, there's a, a question coming into the Q&A box there, but I, I couldn't see anybody raising hands. Maybe you had a different view, but um, it's just, I can't make the question out. It just says, is, is it where you want us? Somebody's replying there. Our time is up, so you can hit send on what you've got in the chat. Maybe we'll get back to Annie's questions. Yeah, no problem. And Lisa, just letting you know the heads up, we had a little bit of sound issues with two or three people, but it seems to be sorted now, just to let you know. Okay, thanks, Maya. Um, okay. Okay, so an inability to add additional options from, from Carrie. Need to be sure all the learning outcomes are being assessed equally. 
correcting load increase. Yeah, absolutely. The dreaded grading and marking. Possible confusion to students getting agreement across multiple lectures on one module, definitely a challenge. Fear that it might be more difficult to explain to external accrediting bodies who visit our school every few years. And that did come up in the research, Linda. Um, accrediting bodies and also external examiners. Um, and a kind of a fear of the perception of the changes um, in those spaces. Lack of access to different technologies. So diversity and choice assessment don't always have to mean additional technology. Um, and I think that's something um, that a lot of people associate with. And certainly technology can open up an enormous amount of um, opportunities for you. And Trevor's going to talk about technology um, in a little bit. And time constraints, time, haven't got the time. Um, and the QQI guidelines, yeah. Institutional support process to get changes absolutely that can be mammoth so it's interesting so a lot of the the challenges that you're talking about are absolutely what came back in our research as well um, so lack of time no resources to support the change a fear of grade inflation so I don't think I've seen that one which is good mm. um, equity of the assessment to previous or other assessments so this idea of fairness and equity um, and a lack of examples. So that came back quite strongly. But the fear of grade inflation one is an interesting one. Um, essentially, what people said was, I introduced this change and then students do better. And then there's a perception that my module is too easy or that there's this grade inflation. Um, now, it's quite interesting because we don't grade on a curve in UCD. We haven't graded on a curve from long before I ever joined UCD and I'm there in early 10 years. Uh, but there is a perception that we should have X number of students will fail the module. Another number will get a D, C, B and A. Um, but that's not the case. And I think that requires institutional support to overcome that fear of perceived grade inflation. Because ultimately, if you have a good choice of assessment, good diversity of assessment, we should expect students to do better. So it's linked to the learning outcomes. You're giving students more of an opportunity to demonstrate that they've met the learning outcomes because you're changing the method. So we would expect that students will do better, so grades should go up. Um, and that shouldn't be in, seen as a potentially negative consequence. The time issue comes back again and again. Um, and I'll talk about it in a second, but essentially where people deemed their choice and diversity of assessment a success, that didn't correlate with the amount of time that it took. So um, it wasn't more successful if it took more time. So while the perception might be that it's going to take too much time, that doesn't seem to have been the experience for those who've actually implemented choice and diversity um, and deemed it successful. Definitely, Lisa. And I think that one about lack of examples from the discipline is, is certainly um, an interesting one. I just see we have a question here from Claire. Are there any examples of supportive policies available that include all of the points, Lisa, that you suggest um, or where could uh, participants find examples of, of how to implement these things? So um, in terms of examples, we have case studies that we've produced. Jordan O'Neill has a practitioner's guide to choice of assessment, which is so, so useful. Um, I'll talk a bit more about it in a second, but it includes an equity template so that you can really expressly go through how one method equates to another, um, how they're going to be graded. It's a really useful exercise for the educator who's designing, but also we give it to the students who can see then that the methods are fair. In terms of policies, I point you towards the national forums work around assessment and methods of assessment and diversifying assessment. So they have lots of um, really good resources there that you can bring back to your institution in terms of mapping that. Um, I certainly don't think we have it all figured out in UCD, that's for sure. So then in terms of the enablers, so I might just get you because we're running short, a little bit shorter on time. So just pop into the chat what you think the enablers will be for um, for choice and diversity of assessment. So I could implement more choice or diversity of assessment if. So what do you think you need? What's the one thing, the one burning issue that you feel like if you had this, um, you would be able to implement choice or diversity? Um, and we won't wait our two minutes, so you can just pop it in as, as you think of it. And I'll share with you then what the enablers were, which 
obviously link back to the barriers and some of them are the opposite. Yeah. Some I just said support. IT support. Yeah. 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 Trevor and I had a long discussion about IT <laughs> today um, <clears throat> and the role that they play in an institution and how important it is in terms of support of, of staff and support of students. Um, more autonomy supported by institution to make changes. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. To actually feel like you are empowered to decide how your module is assessed and that you are the best place person to make that decision. Time, smaller numbers of students, ownership of the module. Mm. They're all really good, Catherine. More autonomy. Um, if I could free up space in my module, a little less content. Yeah. Mm. Um, allow for more guidance and support of students. And more colleagues on board. So all of these are lining up with um, what we had in terms of enablers and how we create and sustain that positive change. So examples and case studies. Um, and as I said, we have so we've three different sets of case studies now that we've produced, and they're they're very, very useful, particularly around inclusive assessment and feedback. Um, the introduction to that um, set of case studies really goes through those principles as well that I've mentioned today. Um, and there's some good examples that I'll mention in a minute, both from UCD and IADT. So that was a collaborative project across the two institutions, which was great. Collaboration and dialogue. So, so many respondents talked about how important it would be if they, if they could just collaborate more with their colleagues in their discipline, if they could talk to the colleagues in their discipline. And that's something that definitely we learned during COVID was the need for colleagues to support each other. And so that people weren't sitting alone, having to reinvent the wheel in terms of addressing different difficulties that were coming up. And we are seeing more community of practices kind of developed after that, which is great. And institutional support. So you do need policies, you need mechanisms that allow you to introduce things like choice of, choice of assessment. So in UCD, Georgian O'Neill did um, lots of work around making sure that choice of assessment was an option when you went into the system to say how your module was going to be assessed. And that took a very long time um, to get implemented. And the key really is to listen to students in terms of sustaining those positive changes. So listening to the feedback that you get from students, paying attention to the student experience um, and working with students and as co-creators as well. So in terms of the benefits in the research they talked about student engagement. So students were more engaged when they had choice of assessment, when they had diversity of assessment, students felt empowered in their learning and that the that these choices and diversity of assessment did accommodate the learning of diverse students in the module. So really powerful in terms of the benefits that were there um, following the choice and diversity. In terms of defining success, so again, we asked them, you know, how was your, was your choice or diversity a success? And if so, why? Um, so improved student engagement, improved learning experience, positive student feedback, good student performance, and lots of people felt like it assessed the learning outcomes more accurately. And as I said before, there was no correlation between the success and resources or between success and familiarity. So it didn't necessarily have to be a really familiar assessment method that they changed to. It didn't have to take lots of resources. So it's clear that the perception of these things and people's experience actually differ. So in terms of implementing choice of assessment, so based on the work that um, Georgian O'Neill has done on our research, there are some kind of key findings to help you if you're going to implement choice. First of all, stick with two choices. So that's really important. Don't give a kind of unlimited number of choices to students. That can be in some ways disempowering or kind of paralyzing for students. So stick with two choices, use the equity template. Um, I think Jess is gonna share uh, the link to the practitioner's guide that Geraldine developed, which has the equity template in it. Um, and there's a separate Word document as well, actually, with the equity template for you to use. Um, have examples for students. So one of the biggest disappointments for people is when they implement choice, they give students two choices and the students stick with the more familiar assessment method. But it requires lots of examples. So students need to see what's expected of them and they need the skills. So if you're, for example, asking a student to do a video, you need to teach the student how to do the video or at least give them resources um, so they can do that. Uh, collaboration with students. So working with the students, going through that equity template with them so they understand the two different assessment method, methods. Consider which module you're going to implement the choice in and implement it early. So students should know from the beginning that they're going to have choice of assessment. It shouldn't be something that they're told about halfway through. And 
better in an early stages module than a late stage module. So this shouldn't be a final year module. And then all of a sudden the student has a choice, um, and particularly if one of the choices is for a less, a much less familiar um, assessment method. And to say it again, the program approach is really, really important when it comes to choice and diversity, not just to have the support of your colleagues, but even to look at to say, well, if by third year we want to be able to offer a choice between a poster and a video, where are we teaching students how to create the video, how to create the poster successfully? And there are lots of different assessment methods. I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but um, I'll give Jess an exercise for you to do as a bit of homework. We all love homework. Um, but to look at all of these different assessment methods, and this is based on some of the work of Phil Race, who's done loads around assessment. And he has a template where he looks at all of these uh, assessment methods. He looks at, well, you know, what are the skills required to do this assessment method? Do, will it link to the learning outcomes? What's the fair? Is it fair, this assessment method? What about academic integrity? What about the authenticity um, of, the, of the assessment method? And what about feedback? When are you going to give feedback? How are you going to give feedback? Um, and the exercise really is to think about how you would universally design each of those assessment methods. So I'm not saying to eliminate any particular type of assessment. There's a place for everything, even a very, very small place for timed exams. Um, but really, it's looking at all of these different methods and seeing what's going to work best for your discipline and how can you design it if you have the, the autonomy to do so. So I'll go through a couple of these examples. I'm running out of time, but I really like this one. It's from IADT. And I'd really recommend that you have a look at those case studies because our colleagues in IADT are doing amazing creative things when it comes to assessment. So in this case study um, from three colleagues in the School of Business in IADT, they have a shared piece of assessment. It's shared across seven different final year modules which means if they weren't sharing this one piece of assessment, that would be seven other individual pieces of assessment that a student would have to engage in. It's authentic, so in the real world, world context. So what happens is at the start of the day, a student is given a brief. By the end of the day, they have to have submitted a response to the brief. And then a week later, they have a meeting with the board, which is kind of a, an interview with some of their lecturers to talk through that brief and defend their decisions in the brief. Um, so it reduces the assessment load, it's creative, it's real world, um, very authentic, uh, and they have really positive feedback from students. And it really prepares students for a task that they may have to do when they go out, you know, following their degree, and it's very much embedded in their discipline. And I really like this one from UCD, from Orna O'Brien, where they take this programmatic approach to assessment, um, which is fantastic in the School of Business. And using reflection and feedback to identify skills for development. So what students do is in semester one, they do a series of um, assessment tasks. In semester two, they're asked to look back at all the feedback they get got from that assessment and reflect on it and decide on what skills do they need to develop based on that feedback and make a plan for how they're going to develop those skills. So again, really good use of feedback and reflection and something that's more creative and diverse, not necessarily a choice, but a diverse assessment. So that's it for me. I'm going to hand over to uh, Trevor. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. God, that was amazing. I need to kind of use uh, those materials myself. But uh, so I'm quickly going to start my own. So I'm going to share my screen and share my presentation. So just give me one moment. Trevor, you beat me to it. I was just going to introduce you, but <laughs> you're oh, no problem. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Excuse the. the uh, I, I I'll quickly say hello. Um, Trevor's, as I introduced earlier, is um our guru in all things AT and UDL, and um he's going to talk us through a couple of um helpful assessment tools. Thanks, Trevor. And just as as we're speaking, Jess has thrown in a lot of links there as well. Thanks very much, Jess. And there'll be more at the end of the session as well. And thanks, Lisa, for that hugely insightful uh, speak in such a short time. It's food for thought. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. Cool. So um, when it comes to assistive technology and assessment, I mean, that's nothing new. We've seen AT um, use in different kind of, um, well, I suppose, uh, summative assessments. So like exams at the end of the year, and that's involved like pieces of software that we probably all know, maybe like text to help read and write goals, the readouts, exam papers or information people have typed. 
where I suppose I want to kind of talk a little bit about is like that broadening of AT and how we're seeing more AT options within the likes of Microsoft Office or Google. And I'll just go through that a little bit more in just a few minutes. So for anyone who's new to assistive technology, what it is basically is this type of technology that's explicitly made to help people uh, you know, with, with disabilities and through that assistance they get from assistive technology, they're able to lead kind of more productive and healthier lives and essentially just belong more with society and partake more in those kind of society events. And of course, the great thing about assistive technology is that it's also part of UDL and it's received, we see it as one of the checkpoints in the action and expression principle as well. So it's great that UDL acknowledges that assistive technology as well and the power of it, especially for the teaching and learning environment. So when it comes to examples of assistive technology, um, I mean, we see low tech, the non-tech examples of assistive technology. So for example, today I'm wearing my assistive technology on my face. So eyeglasses are really commonplace. And for mid tech, spelling and grammar supports in words that we're all familiar with, which I use a lot. And then in high tech, using like uh, my Google Home device, um, which I um, access through my smartphone, is something I use a lot as well. So when it comes to assistive technology, and the point that I really try to bring up with this slide is that like it is abundant and it is surrounds us all the time. But for some reason, whether it's culturally or just other factors, we haven't named it assistive technology. And I think a slight injustice then happens out of that because then we're less familiar or less acculturated to this notion of assistive technology. So when students are then come, when they come across assistive technology, maybe for the first time when they enter college, it seems kind of like an alien kind of concept to them, um, even though it's been surrounding them their whole lives. And so one of the reasons why I like this slide is to just get people thinking about maybe even naming what's in their everyday lives as assistive technology. And then when we see AT in education, just bring it, looking at the context of this like pyramid of inclusion that's in one of the AHEAD publications, we see on the very top all those specialized assistive technologies that will always be there and will always need the likes of assistive technology officers or AT specialists to support um, that integration of assistive technology into the everyday lives of the students, you know, to help them participate fully into the educational experience. But what we've seen added to that are these other layers of inclusion and how assistive technology exists in all these other wider parts of that pyramid as well. So where we see Office 365 and Google, um, which are these uh, digital ecosystems now that exist in education, within these ecosystems, we're seeing the likes of maybe dictation tools in say Word or Google Docs where people can now have the choice to not only type their assignments, but they can like uh, use their voices to create content in their essays. But we can also see things like Immersive Reader, which is now in Office 365 where students have the choice of maybe listening back to their essays. So instead, rather than just proofreading an essay by reading it back, they can proof listen to assignments as well. Uh, and even just using immersive reader, or different read aloud tools, just to read back information to support studying, the committing information to memory, or even the comprehension of written information as well. So I think we're at this time where now we're seeing this abundance of assistive technology um, throughout, and that's available to everyone. So every student who has a Google or a Microsoft Office um, account now have access to all these different tools. So I suppose where I'm kind of going with this is that I'm thinking like, do we need to think differently about AT now that it's so abundant? And if so, do we need to think about maybe putting different supports or structures in for students to acquire uh, the knowledge that these tools exist in these digital ecosystems and then to develop those skills? And also not only to develop skills that we see in Office 365 or Google, but the transferability of these skills as well transfer from an education context to a work context as well. So like I would see so much potential in definitely education institutions or centers recognizing these kind of skills in terms of kind of lifelong learning as well. So essentially assistive technology is about leveling that playing field. So through that choice of assistive technology being offered 
um, we're seeing then possibilities of more students than ever having uh, the ability to choose how they want to create or connect with information. So, and by creating this level playing field where this abundance of assistive technology is available to students, not only is their academic or the potential for belonging to be enhanced in their education institutions, but also in terms of just emotionally, their confidence and their self-worth uh, blossoming as well because of this. So that's why I think the, you know, the need or desire to definitely make AT awareness more prolific into that student culture, or even the staff culture as well, um, I think has never been so important because it's just there and so abundant. And then even within our own learning survey that we did here in AHEAD, uh, we've seen assistive technology um, usage increasing um, by, I think, 64%, the survey said as well. So I think maybe that's a plus from the pandemic as well, that maybe um, if we interpret that a little bit, maybe assistive technology has given students more independent learning. I would hope so. And, and that would be a positive from the use of assistive technology um, as students were at home, uh, you know, using AT to support their learning. And then within that as well, there's a desire from students to get more training as well about, you know, the potential of assistive technology to support them. So again, where we have tried to address this in ahead is to create this Discover Your AT um, tool. So within that, we're attempting to, you know, broaden or increase that awareness of assistive technology, because when it comes to assessments, or even, I suppose I'm just thinking continuous assessment, um, you know, for those students who are writing essays, for example, that they have the options now of immersive reader to uh, listen back to information or using dictation to create content in essays or using dictation in terms of a new approach to them uh, writing uh, to go about planning an assignment as well that now we're looking at maybe the need for creating additional or increased information about um, this. So what I might do is I will just share my screen with that. So I'm just gonna briefly show the Discover Your AT tool um, that we've created. And within it, there's three simple questions that we ask people just to engage in. So the first question is simply about just acknowledging what has kind of driven you, what's the main drive that's brought you to this site that you really want to explore in terms of assistive technology. So it might be the likes of say, reading, for example, it might be writing, um, it also could be about organization. And there's many other kind of different options that we give students. And that's what I'm going to put down for my first question, those three items. And then for the first one, or for the second question, I'm just going to simply select which tools I either own or have access to. Um, so for me, it's about a Windows computer, um, an Android tablet, and an Android phone. But I have access partially to Microsoft Surface, so I can select that. And it, for many students, maybe just recognizing the type of device that they either own or have access to can sometimes be a challenge. So we've added this feature, which detects the device that you're currently working on. So if you're unsure of the device, just click on this tool, and that'll identify the device you're using. And then I simply choose this button uh, to go to the next question. And I just select which uh, basic digital ecosystems I have access to. So I have access to Microsoft and Google. So I'll choose those. And then by clicking on show my results, it's going to pull up all those options that I have available to me. So in terms of like immersive reader, and then I can see just a brief synopsis here is going to help me with reading and writing, uh, a number of apps it's suggesting as well, how OneNote in Office 365 can help, um, different paid options um, that also have free trials I could access, like Excel read and write software and even Word and how Word can help me with reading and how there's an option that's really available. So here we are trying to encourage students to explore um, those assistive technologies that will most suit that need that's uh, 
driving them really, and that drive could be about an assessment. And that assessment may require them, say, to write. So they're looking at maybe different options uh, to go about writing an essay. So then very simply, they just put in their email address here and I can send that to my own email account. And send now, and this unique URL that's created every time someone goes to this kind of output page at the end, it would, means that I can now return to this specific web page with all these options that I can refer to in my own time. And even with each option, there is a, a button that will take them directly to a web page, giving them more information about a specific tool. So, for example, Immersive Reader, if I click here, it'll take me to a page that outlines succinctly what Immersive Reader does, as well as a video, and should the student desire information in video format as well as reading the essay. So, to address this new abundance of assistive technology information, we hope that this is going to be something that students um, and educators will gravitate towards, uh, because especially when it comes to the likes of assessments, which are really one of the main drivers um, for students in education, that we hope now that this new choice of AT and this availability of assistive technology you know, will encourage them to um, try out kind of our AT exploratory tool. And then one thing I'm looking at in particular is this, and this notion of you know, how assistive technology has become so abundant now and is so available to all students. So it's no longer just siloed to specific students who have just registered with the disability service. There's now increased options um, for students in Microsoft and Google. And then I'm increasingly beginning to explore the idea that we all have this AT infrastructure built into our learning systems um, that our institution has paid for. And some students now are using these features. So they're already using dictation and immersive reader or in Google Docs, they might be using uh, the, the dictation feature as well. And then in that way, they're becoming part of this hidden curriculum that we see in education. So sometimes students, they're not being assessed on the use of assistive technology, but they're just gravitating towards it because it's just a way of them going about, let's say, their assignments. And it's a, it's a way that suits them. Because maybe instead of typing, which they might either feel like they're just slow at typing, maybe they might have a preference for dictation because they're better at expressing their ideas verbally rather mm -hmm. than typing. And then that way, dictation could suit their needs. So now, like, because assistive technology, because it's so prolific and potentially within this hidden curriculum, is this kind of a new way then of, say, building awareness about these tools and how they can offer choices to students and how they interact or create content um, for their learning and for assessments. So, I mean, it would be great to hear your thoughts even in the chat. Um, like how many people have considered, you know, assistive technology and maybe advocated within their own remit? Um, are, are there educators out there who have just never considered assistive technology? Um, and if so, you know, is, is there potential now for an educator to see the value of it for their students? Um, and then I suppose some of the fears about this could be like, do educators think they might have to become assistive technology experts in order to advocate it? And that we're really hoping that that's not the case, especially because in like Office and Google, you know, there's potentially just three clicks to click on to, to activate Immersive Reader or your dictation tool. And so that kind of techno, heavy um, in kind of attitude towards technology has really declined over the years. Um, where now using technology has become easier and has meant like not long installations of software or not kind of adding on or bolting on extra soft, uh, like software or technologies. So like within Word, you just find, say, for example, dictation. So in your home tab, we see the dictation tool right there. So students can just click on it. So now say for the likes of me, which I use dictation, 
and I have the option of speaking out some of my sections because sometimes I'm just really clear about what I want to type. So for me, it's easy. I just speak out those options. And then I do a mixture of typing and dictation. And then for students, um, I include myself in that, um, proofreading um, using Immersive Reader is a tool that I find really helpful. So now with these just two types of uh, assistive technologies that exist in Word alone, I'm just kind of focusing on these because I, essay writing and Word are just synonymous with education, that when we just look at, say, words and Word documents, like, is there like a greater likelihood that maybe educators would kind of draw students' attention to these kind of tools in Word and just, in a way, not only help students um, understand the possibilities with Word now, but also um, maybe start generating, as I said, that AT awareness and maybe just get people talking about these tools more. And again, just start to think about embedding, you know, that knowledge, that tacit knowledge uh, about assistive technology. So again, it helps students to just acculturate um, a lot more effectively to that kind of education environment that they're going to be in for maybe a year or four years or five years as well. So, and one simple thing that um, we kind of try to advocate here is like when it comes to assistive technology, maybe your role is simply by just signposting students to these technologies. So if you could just consider for a moment, maybe if you've written an assignment, is it possible to just take this paragraph, just copy it, and paste it at the end of your assignment. So then when the student kind of reads, you know, what your assignment is about, that you can just draw their attention to these tools where they can find more information about them and how these tools can be utilized in their uh, writing process. Um, so I think then the onus really is on the students to either explore on their own right or to explore it with their classmates and then to adopt those, that, those tools that suit whatever needs uh, that's driving them to experiment or try different things. And then just final thoughts about it before I um, stop talking is to just think about uh, that assistive technology awareness. And really when it comes to it um, about like where we hear about it or when we talk about it, I don't think we're either thinking or talking about it enough. Um, and then if there was potential to talk more about assistive technology in education, could it be part of like study skills modules that some courses have, or some schools have like IT modules as well. And then within those, could assistive technology be part of that kind of module uh, content? And, uh, and to, again, to draw students' awareness to, or even for reflective writing pieces. Maybe students could just choose an, an AT within Microsoft or Google and just write about it um, uh, in terms of like uh, the possibility of uh, exploring their own learning. And then for these AT tools of Microsoft and Google, sometimes these can be seen as maybe a stepping stone to technologies that they could avail of by an assistive technology officer in um, either tertiary education, once they're registered with a disability service, and then with the likelihood of, say, other staff. Like, is it possible maybe for library staff to think about AT more? And um, because those students kind of entering the library, maybe just some knowledge about immersive reader or other kind of read aloud tools might actually encourage students to persist longer with reading and it might just complement that library atmosphere um, that they would, that students would be participating in. And then when it comes to assistive technology, do we recognize it as part of digital literacy? And if so, is AT part of lifelong learning? Which I definitely think it is. And then AT for continuous assessment, I definitely see like from my own sake and from students using tools like dictation, and as I said, read aloud are just really good tools, uh, even to be aware of, because you never know in your conversations with other people by talking about AT that you might spark an interest in AT with other people too. And then within your own roles, is it possible to just raise AT awareness in some way, if not just to tell people about that discovery tool, AT tool that we have in our hands? So thank you very much. Sorry, that I know that, that was a speedy one. So um, happy to answer any questions and get any feedback. Thank you, Trevor. That was really insightful. I think as the, some of the comments in the chat box there, it's all about awareness. And as you said, signposting people. 
Um, as Trevor said, if there's any question and answers, we've got a couple of minutes to yeah, answer. So I, I can see that there are a few hands up here. So I'm just going to give Laura Lee, I can see that your hand up has, has been up for a while. So I'm just going to give you the ability to talk there. So if you can unmute yourself, Laura. Sorry, Jen, my apologies. That was a mistake. Didn't mean to have it up. But oh, no problem at all. Before you click the wrong button. But thanks a million to, to all the presenters. They're really useful um, and delighted to have to have been here. So thanks a million. That's no problem. Well. Thank, thanks, Laura. Um, so I'm just going to check. Um, Annie Connell, do you, do you still have a question? I can see that your hand is up. I'm going to allow you to talk there if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, apologies, I didn't mean to leave that up. Um, I'm fine, thank you. No problem, no problem. Um, that's fine. So Elaine, equally, I can see that you have your hand up. I'm going to allow you to talk now, um, just in case you have a question. Sorry, that's a, it shouldn't be up. Sorry about that. No, that's no problem. Um, I can see that there's questions there just about the, uh, the link, the Bitly link. So if you pop Bitly, forward slash AT into your browser and um, that will come up. So it's bit.ly forward slash AT paragraph and um, Trevor's signpost will come up there. And we will also be emailing um, all of those links out to all attendees also. So listen, I, I think there's no questions from uh, from the attendees. Do any of our panelists have questions for each other or? Um, gosh, I mean, I have loads of questions for Lisa. Like, uh, <laughs> It's generally about life. It's generally about life. But like, um, well, something that I'm really curious in is like, Lisa, I suppose, where, where's the, what's the dream, the assessment dream? You know, like, is there a formula kind of already kind of uh, in, coming together in your head about where you would like to see, like, you know, the, the greatest approach to assessment? That's a good question. So the assessment paradise. Um, yeah. So I, I think um, it's very difficult to say because every module is different and the module coordinator is the person who knows their discipline really well. So, I mean, when I do kind of consultation with academics across the university, I don't go in with a set idea of what I'm going to recommend that they do. So it's really just look at what you've got there already. What are the gaps? What has the student feedback been? So I think, I suppose that the, the assessment paradise is that students give feedback on how they're assessed. That feedback is then translated into action in terms of change in the assessment strategy. Then that's trialed and go from there. So I think having students as partners in assessment, and that can mean something as simple as telling them right from the beginning how they're going to be assessed. So that transparency is there. They've got really clear instructions, clear examples, a clear rubric, um, or it can be co-creating co-creating assessment methods. Uh, but I suppose keeping the student center of the assessment strategy and trying not to keep the time it's going to take to do the assessment of feedback as the priority in terms of how you assess, which is difficult now. Mm. It's a very long, not very helpful answer there, Trevor. No, I mean, it's a great answer because I, I love the bit about co-creating with the students. But I imagine for some people that might be the biggest barrier to overcome to think of the student as you know, a collaborator in the, in the curriculum. Yeah. So this is back to all of our um, UDL promotion and UDL is a mindset. It's not a, it's not a tick box. But once you start to think in that um, frame of mind, then your perspective changes and how you think about the student changes in terms of yeah. who as a partner in their learning rather than a uh, kind of passive recipient of learning. Yeah. Well, I definitely know the first time I worked with students collaboratively, like I did feel my, my I recognized my thirst for control and power uh, through it. So once I let it go, it was actually brilliant, you know, because I found myself just having totally new insights that I never realized. And it is scary. Like it's scary from an academic perspective and scary as the student to be given that power if you haven't been given it before. Yeah. Um, but I think it, the results can be really, really uh, impactful and very positive. Okay. 
Claire, Good one from Claire there, collaboration using Google Claire, Docs. Google Docs yeah. yeah. And I think that collaboration with students has become so much easier. It's so much easier in the online classroom in a lot of ways than it is in the physical classroom because of things like Google Docs and other, all of the wonderful technologies that Trevor was talking about. Oh yeah, like even one of the great things I love about Google Docs is you can see who has written what you, the, the information is color coded. So it's a great way yeah. of just for the educator if the document share with them to see like who has done what part. Yeah, you can track. Okay, thanks very much. I just was anybody else any questions before we wrap up? I've, I've only got ten more questions for Lisa. <laughs> we'll be here <laughs> um, listen I just want to flag our next webinar uh, webinar just a big thanks to Lisa and contributors today and the participants thanks so much for joining us our next webinar in this series is on December the 14th learning from COVID innovations and disability support um, so hopefully um, we'd like to see you all again and please disseminate the links to your colleagues and um, Jess is going to drop it in the box there in a minute um, the links to join up in our next webinar um, and thanks so much for today if anybody else any of the panelists want to say anything else no thanks very much no, thanks everybody for sharing thanks, their their barriers and enablers it's really interesting as well was. thanks Lisa thanks everybody we'll sign off for today um, I'm going to drop that link in the box in a second as well for those people that, that want it there. Thanks. Thanks, Tommy. Have a good afternoon. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. It's going to stay on for a minute there, guys. Either. Right, it's just us. Okay. Jess, I apologize. Karen, my sincere apologies. I forgot to thank you as well. If you're oh, still there. Don't Sorry, worry. Karen, apologies. No worries at all. Listen, I just wanted to say to Trevor about your microphone. Yeah. Is it I was going to say it was a bit glitchy. Oh, yeah. no. no. It's when your voice gets a bit quieter, it just kind of cuts out altogether. So, like, towards the ends of your sentences. But oh. that's never happened before. So, it's because I, you're always very clear. So that's what's making me think. Yeah. We're using a different mic, Trevor, one of them no, jumper it's, ones. There. It's the same microphone. And it's really strange because it just doesn't work as well sometimes. And then sometimes it just works fine. And I've checked it for loose cables and it's never a loose cable issue. It's actually perfect there now. Oh, yeah. It? You're kidding. Me. I noticed it's that's when your strange. head turned to one direction. It was you were I was we were losing you towards the end of some of your sentences. Mm. Oh really? And yes. earlier on there was problems with leases, but I think that was just the participants. There was two or three people it's common okay. that they couldn't hear you. Yeah. I think yeah. that was just that was probably it, yeah. their connection. Um that was a them problem. Um, <laughs> and hate, sorry I hate to say that. But, uh, I, I was telling to Lisa a few minutes ago. Sorry about he's frozen. My fumble yeah, start okay. there because in the middle of it, whatever happened to my screen, the notes I had opened vanished and I couldn't get them back up again. Oh no. I, was in panic <laughs> oh, I never noticed. Hopefully it went okay. I know. <laughs> Thank well, you. Yeah. No, no, that, that was fine. I think that was smooth. So
Glad Thanks for coming in there a lot, Jess. Yeah. You saved the day a few times. Thank you. No, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's just about keeping keeping it going, isn't it? Um, perfect. So we all happy to to leave it there. Thanks, Mel, for that, Lisa. That was really great. And yeah, Trevor, it was, it was always yeah. really, really good. And I think you you make AT very just understandable. understandable I think it kind of exactly. demystifies yeah. it a little yeah. bit and. Definitely. Uh, I hope and I thought that was interesting. The question that came through was it from Sarah? She was like, "If only there was a tool that I could use." Yeah, it's yeah. like we planted her. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I don't recall putting an audience planting oh, her. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to leave. Thanks a million. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks Mel, for that, Karen. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Mel. Bye, bye. Thanks, Lisa, again. Oh. Um, oh, hopefully, we'll chat again soon. I don't feel I've chatted. I think we're you chatting tomorrow. Before. Yes, we are. Yeah. Meeting tomorrow. Yeah. So much on. Cool. Thanks, thanks all guys. Yeah. All right. Thanks, 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 guys. Have a good so, evening, everyone. Thanks, you, you too. too. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.